Hi, everybody. This is Darren Powderly. Welcome back to another edition of Street Beats. I'm here today with Brian Sanger. He is the president and CEO of the Ratkovich Company, located in Los Angeles, California. I first uh, got exposure to the Ratkovich Company on a trip to LA one time when I drove by this humongous building and it was uh, being rehabilitated at the time. And uh, I had heard that YouTube was looking to lease some space in, in the building. And it was one of the big, you know, uh, cornerstone type of property developments that was happening in Los Angeles at that time that was, you know, part of Silicon Beach's uh, uh, popularity, you know, growing popularity at that time. We've come a long way since then, but uh, it's a real pleasure to have the Ratkovich company and Brian join us here today. So, Brian, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, please introduce yourself and please tell us a little bit about yourself and the firm. Well, Darren, well, thank you for having me. It's a, a pleasure to be with you and the CrowdStreet platform and StreetBeat. So I appreciate you taking some time with me today. So I'm Brian Sanger. I'm the president and CEO of the Rackovich Company. We're a Southern California-based uh, real estate development and property management firm that specializes in urban infill and historic rehabilitation products. And we have been doing that for over 40 years. Uh, Wayne Rackovich, our founder, started the company in the 1970s and it's evolved to where it has today based on his leadership uh, and vision. Yeah, and, and Wayne, let's take a moment to, to talk about Wayne. Uh, I'm a member of the Urban Land Institute and uh, Wayne Ratkovich is a, a bit of a living legend within those circles. And so real estate people might know who, who the Urban Land Institute is, but uh, they celebrate Wayne for many reasons, not only the contributions to the Los Angeles community, build, building of the city, but he also is well known for his philanthropy and contributions. Maybe you just share a little bit about what it's like working with Wayne over the years. Yeah, so my relationship with Wayne and the company started over 20 years ago. And my role at that time was being their attorney at an outside law firm. So I got to get a peek of their projects I got a glimpse into that and got to see what Wayne and his team was doing along the way, which was certainly intriguing. Um, as you mentioned, Wayne's a member of ULI, has been a member for many years. He's currently a life trustee, which is an honor that's not bestowed on many. I think there are around 18 life trustees in right. the ULI history. He's earned those accolades, certainly by the work he's done. And one of the things that we're probably most well known for as a company is his and our team's work on 18 historic projects, 18 historic buildings in the Southern California region, amongst which, which are the 11 buildings that you're talking about at the Howard Hughes Aircraft Company campus in Playa Vista. Let's talk about some of the things we've done a little bit in the past. We, we were fortunate and we transacted on a, a 5900 Wilshire, which was a property in the Miracle Mile area of Los Angeles. Uh, we and our partners sold that building in March uh, of 2020, so right before the pandemic hit. Uh, we were at over 90% occupied, and we're getting over $50 a square foot per year uh, for tenants for leases in that building. Um, that was kind of an uh, example of the types of things we do. We took a you know 30-plus story office tower built in the 1970s that had an ownership that really couldn't get their arms around the leasing. And as you know, office is a capital intensive uh, opportunity mm -hmm. uh, with respect to tenant improvements and leasing commissions and building systems. You know, unlike multifamily where your lease comes up, you don't get, go in and demo all the walls of your of your apartment when your lease is up. But when when your office lease is up, even though it's a longer term, you, you generally have to reposition the, the, the office space, demo the walls and lay it out for the new tenant coming in. So it's a capital intensive opportunity. Yeah. Um, 5900 Wilshire particularly, you know, had a large vacancy in it, uh, and we were able to kind of, re, you know, take the branding, similar to the branding we had done at Hercules, brand the building and position it so that it would be attractive to those types of tenants that could see the opportunity. And then also doing spec suites and other things to the building, uh, we repositioned the lobby, took the colonnade which was once an outdoor space and turned into a beautiful indoor lobby, a picture of which you kind of see behind my shoulder here. Um, to attract those types of tenants. So over time, we were able to do that. We were able to, to kind of do a creative, op, creative modern office concept in a high-rise tower. Uh, so that's some of the, the things we try to bring to our projects, whether it's a, a horizontal campus like Playa Vista, or it's a vertical campus like 5900 Wilshire, we try to bring the same techniques. Um, so 
fast forward a little bit, we've owned a property out in Alhambra, California, which is just to the east of Los Angeles in called the gateway of the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, we've owned the Alhambra project for about 20 years now. It's about a million square feet of office in a, we'll call it a horizontal campus on about mm -hmm. 40 acres. Um, so we've been very successful in the pandemic, uh, keeping our tenants in place. Uh, we've actually done a substantial amount of leasing there. And we're also in the process of getting some entitlements for roughly 14 acres of parking lots and putting some multifamily in those parking lots. And so we're working through the process on that. We're also working on a project in, uh, in San Pedro to do some ground up retail construction down there on a project on about 40 acres as well. So office, multifamily, retail, lots of mixed use. Would you say that uh, the Rakovich company has one, uh, one specialist uh, asset type or, or is it pretty uh, spread out amongst those three and more? Yeah, I think if you look at our portfolio and what we've done in the past, kind of the, the mainstay has been office mm -hmm. and surrounding that has been a mixed use component, whether it's retail or hospitality uh, or in the case of the Alhambra multifamily mm -hmm. to create, uh, in the case of the Alhambra, we called it an, an, it an urban community, right? There was a long term vision when we bought that property. We had the office. We were successful in leasing the office. We built some retail to accompany the office. And now we have multifamily to create a true urban community where people can live and work, walk, and you know have less of an imprint on the surrounding area because all of the amenities they need are close by. Yeah. Let's talk about drivers for office demand. I'm sticking on that topic for a moment and talking about like you've seen some leasing or positive leasing through the pandemic in office. I think I think most people would be surprised to hear that. You know, um, many of our investors out there are just reading headline news and, and wondering what is going on with the office market. And uh, you, you have a lot of different opinions out there, but what are you seeing the data show you uh, about the office market today? And, and what does that data you know, tell you about you know, office market going forward in say the next one to three years? Yeah, so you know, everybody brings their probably personal experience to the table, right? Many of mm -hmm. us who work in the office space understand that we're not working there and then have an idea of what that's doing to the marketplace. So what we're seeing, uh, particularly in Los Angeles, is you know office vacancy is up a bit. Uh, I actually saw a statistic that showed that year over year downtown office vacancy was down slightly. Mm -hmm. um, you've got large sublease space, particularly on the west side, that's come to bear. Uh, and the question is, how is that all going to flush out? Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned with Alhambra, there are opportunities and opportunists out there in the marketplace looking to expand. So for mm -hmm. instance, in the downtown Los Angeles market, you had a law firm just signed for a little over 110,000 square feet on a 15 year term, because I think they recognized there was an opportunity there. Yeah. There was an opportunity that they needed to renew, that they could take advantage of where the marketplace was and they were able to do that. That may be a particularly um, unique circumstance, right? You've got a kind of a white collar firm that's able to work remotely, they're able to probably just sustain the revenue from, the, from their legal fees, mm -hmm. uh, which would you know, give them the foresight to say, okay, we're, we're managing through this. And so we have a long-term view and so we're gonna sign a 15 year lease. But there are three other law firms that have requirements in downtown LA of 60,000 square feet or more, and they're also looking for 15 year terms. And there's a financial firm in downtown that has a 200,000 square foot requirement. It's also looking for a 15 year term. So, You've got these groups out there who are looking long term and seeing an end to the pandemic and a return to the workplace who are willing to place bets and do really long term leases. That's interesting. And um, I know you're doing some work in the office market outside of Los Angeles. How often do you go outside of Los Angeles uh, for your investments or acquisitions or developments? And, and what are some of the driving factors that help you decide to, to do a deal outside of Los Angeles? Yeah, so um, our platform kind of over the last several years has been Southern California focused. And kind of when the pandemic hit, we were looking around at opportunities just generally in our business plan and looking to see if there were other markets that we could uh, be successful in. So we uh, were looking at places like Boise and some of the other mountain states. Certainly Salt Lake City has come up on the radar in the last few years, Denver um, as well. And then you're also talking, you know, Colorado Springs is now coming up on the radar. So those have kind of just, to me personally, been intriguing. 
Um, I say, particularly on Boise, I've been kind of a fan from afar. Uh, I read the Wall Street Journal, and when you start talking about migration or in-migration, or you talk about different markets, uh, that name Boise comes up often in, mm -hmm. in that publication. So um, there was an opportunity that came up recently for us that we've been pursuing there, thinking that we could take our expertise in the office space and translate that to other markets, uh, assuming that we're comfortable with the market and some of the drivers that you're talking about in the market. Obviously, you know, coming from Los Angeles and seeing kind of what's going on with the unemployment rate, what's going on with the cost of living, looking to see if there are places that people are going to uh, in which, you know, again, we could bring our expertise in the creative modern office to that location, to tech firms moving there or other companies moving there who would benefit from that type of office space and, and want that type of office space. Boise is a super dynamic market. I mean, I, definitely the inbound migration from people just moving there. And I know there's there's probably a pretty steady stream of people from California moving to places like Oregon and Idaho and Boise in particular. And um, a question that that I think some people have is like, does that mean they're going to also occupy space uh, in office buildings? You know, and, and what kind of tenants do you seek to at least this this office building to? Yeah, so I, you know that, that's a question for everybody. But I think going back to your point about you know your personal experience, Darren, and and for your mm -hmm. company, what you what you think the plan is, you know, the idea of the office space continuing to be valuable is is a sentiment that's shared by many people, many executives. Um, you know, many executives see themselves keeping the same amount or increasing the amount of office space that they're going to need over the next three years. Um, and, and it's also supported by the fact that they see, too, the need for collaboration, the need for a place to train, the need to have those coincidental conversations, if you will. And employees are seeing it, too, right, that they, they want to build relationships. They want to have the collaboration uh, with their colleagues. Now, again, will it be a more flexible office place? Probably. Um, mm -hmm. but, but there will be a need. And if you have to put people into a space, you may need more space for those same people. So, um, you know, with respect to uh, Boise in particular in that market, while people may be going there and some may be working remotely, you know, often uh, and currently there are, are companies going there to look to uh, expand into the market to, to either put their headquarters there or to expand existing locations there. Um, I think what's bringing them there are a variety of factors. Uh, you have low unemployment, you have a highly educated workforce, you have lower cost of living, you have a, a lifestyle there an outdoor amenity lifestyle that people are just very much drawn to. Um, so we think just the historic office vacancy has been really low, particularly in that market. Uh, and I think just overall, uh, as people are moving there, there will be a need for office. And I think uh, for us, what we seek to do is to provide a class, a market leading product wherever we go. So we are willing to go somewhere that we believe in and we want to compete with all the other properties. And we think that we'll get our competitive share of those tenants who want to have office space. It'll be really cool to see what, you know, the, the Boise office market looks like in terms of tenant improvements and interior design and different amenities that a Boise you know, tenant is seeking out. Is it, is it the same as, as a Los Angeles market? Maybe downtown Los Angeles is different than uh, Silicon Beach, you know, in Santa Monica, which probably is the case. Uh, and how will that, you know, other, other mountain region uh, locations where people are moving in droves? Absolutely. I don't, I don't think that's going to reverse, especially now that corporate, you know, employers are saying, hey, are people want to be there and the technology is available. Let's set up a, a, a secondary office there. Let's do the hub and spoke model, right? And may, maybe, maybe not move the headquarters there, but let's let's give our employees employees a place to uh, to be. But it, it'll also be interesting to see what what some of the amenity packages look like in a place like Boise versus. Are you are you getting any feedback on on any differences there? Or is it pretty similar? Um, the amenity packages haven't been. Uh with respect to the building itself, like the basic building amenities, right? So if, mm -hmm. in Boise in particular, right? If you have a room to put your bike and you have a room uh, where you can take a shower and kind of get ready if you bike into work, that's about it, right? You don't need yeah. a bunch of outdoor barbecue space and you don't need, you know, all this other stuff. Um, and oftentimes I say that even when we do put that in in Los Angeles, it looks nice for the marketing tour, but nobody ever uses it, right? <laughs> but in the case of Boise, right? If you can have some 
good basic amenities, a good location, a strong sponsorship ownership, strong property management and provide good tenant uh, and client services. All you have to do is open up your door and walk outside, right? You're, you're right there, right next to all the amenities outdoors you would ever need and the culture you would need. And if you wanna go ski, it's uh, less than an hour away. You've got premier ski resorts that are two hours away. Um, you've got a river that's right down the street. Um, yeah. so, so the building itself doesn't necessarily have to have the amenities, but once you open the door and the location, that should be what you really rely on. Well, let's uh, let's circle back to LA for a second. I, I, I am, I'm really curious because you live in LA and you've been there for a long time. What's life like in LA right now? I think, I think a lot of people are curious about it. You know, we want to get the inside scoop from someone like you and, and what your employees are reporting. Uh, what's your sense for what's happening right now in Los Angeles as, as the pandemic, we start to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel and people becoming vaccinated and, and hopefully a return to normalcy sometime very soon. Life in Los Angeles is getting back to normal. I know, you know, we I've been out of town on some business trips and seen that's a little bit more open in other places with respect to indoor dining and other things. And we have not quite gotten there yet, but um, the numbers are coming down quickly. Uh, one of my sons actually went back to school on a limited basis, which was great for everybody, including him. Yes. Um, so I think we're a little bit slower to get back to everything, but people are ready for it, particularly the weather's getting nice here. Um, so, you know, once that time comes, I think you're going to just see this explosion of energy back into the world, people spending money, going to restaurants and retailers and supporting those businesses. And I'm very much looking forward to it. Any other thoughts about, you know, real estate investment for, you know, say the next six months or so as, as things start to open back up where you see opportunities, you and your team at the Rakovich company? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're optimistic. And that's not just because we are owners and developers of office space and other commercial space, but um, just from personal experiences, you know, we, we hired somebody during the pandemic. We actually hired two people during the pandemic and just understanding the need to be together. I was just thinking about your comment at the end of the, your comments about getting back to normal, right? It's just gonna be nice to like shake somebody's hand or give yeah. somebody a hug, right? I mean, it's just to be able to do that. But my outlook is this, you know, it's gonna take a little bit of time as everybody knows for people to kind of get their, their legs under them. But I think that employers and employees will come back to the workspace. Uh, that will, there will be a need for office. There will be a need for retail, multifamily and, and the, the office, the, the types of products we've been talking about. And, and we're just looking to kind of be ahead of that, looking for opportunities now while we're getting our legs under ourselves and, and just seeking to be ahead of when that demand comes to the market. So that's, that's our goal as a company. Yeah, well, I, I, I love the fact that uh, we're partners. I appreciate uh, the fact that we're doing business together. And, uh, you know, because I have so much admiration for you and your team, for the projects that you've all delivered over the last 40 years at the Ratkevich company. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a student of real estate and I just really love, you know, how companies like yours, you know, make a city a better place, a more fun place, more entertaining place. Uh, we didn't even mention the fact that you, uh, was it the Willett Theater that you guys remodeled? Yeah, so the Wiltern Theater on the Miracle Mile was one of the early uh, rehabilitation projects that, that Wayne was a part of. What a gem. I mean, like to, to add that to the community, that's what I'm talking about, like really contributing to the community, giving to the people that, uh, that occupy you know, your space, but also to just giving to anybody who, who happens to be fortunate to live in a community where you're, you're delivering projects. So uh, thanks for all you do. And thanks for joining us today on Street Beats. I want to say thank you, Darren. Thanks to the Crowd Street team. They've been great. And uh, we look forward to talking soon. Sounds great. Thank you, Brian. <laughs>